afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us on this rather dreary gray day in February. I'd like to introduce Dr. Samantha Adut. She is a practicing pediatrician at Pediatric Associates of Alexandria in Virginia and an assistant professor of pediatrics at Virginia Commonwealth University School of Medicine in the Inova campus. She serves as the chair of pediatrics at Inova Alexandria Hospital and is the delegate at large from Northern Virginia on the board of the Virginia chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Dr. Adud is a member of the AAP Council on Environmental Health Executive Committee and served as lead author on their Global Climate Change and Children's Health Policy Statement and Technical Report published in Pediatrics in November of 2015. She has testified on behalf of the AAP on numerous occasions in support of the Environmental Protection Agency's Clean Power Plan and a stronger ozone standard and presents often at academic conferences and meetings on climate change and child health. She is co-founder of Virginia Clinicians for Climate Action, a coalition of clinicians bringing climate and health educational events and advocacy opportunities to the medical community in Virginia. We are so grateful to have her speak today um, for our Lunch and Learn. Absolutely. Thank you for coming on, Dr. Adut. Oh, well, thank you so much. And I'm going to pull up my presentation right now. Uh, let's see here. Here we go. All right. Oops. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. And it is my pleasure to speak to you all today about what the changing climate means for the health of children. And at the end of today's talk, I hope you all will understand what climate change means, how climate change affects child health, and how the health system can protect health by protecting the planet. So I'm going to dedicate five minutes to an extremely cursory review of the complex topic, what is climate change, before I discuss what it has to do with the health of children. And I will start with the greenhouse effect. The greenhouse effect is what underlies the whole climate change phenomenon. It was first described in the 1800s, and it can be demonstrated with simple science experiments. Basically, when the sun's radiation reaches the Earth, some of it is absorbed directly, which is what warms the ground, the pavement, but most of it is reflected off again as infrared radiation. Some of this reflected radiation goes back into space, but some of it is absorbed by heat-trapping gases in our atmosphere. These gases include water vapor, carbon, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and others. And these gases, which are called greenhouse gases, act like a blanket. They don't generate any heat. They just retain the heat that is reflected off of the Earth. And they are essential for life on our planet. Without these gases, the planet would be very, very cold and inhospitable. But since the Industrial Revolution, people have been burning fuels made from fossils millions of years ago, such as coal, oil, and gas. And when we burn these fuels, which are called fossil fuels, we release greenhouse gases, which were previously stored deep in the earth. Combustion of these fuels has led to a dramatic increase in the concentration of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. And this is an image of some of the processes that emit greenhouse gases. They include combustion of of coal, oil, and gas for energy, air and land transportation, agriculture, uh, and landfills also produce greenhouse gases. So carbon dioxide, or CO2, is considered the most important greenhouse gas. And for hundreds of thousands of years, and for all of modern civilization, human civilization as we know it, CO2 in the atmosphere has remained within a limited range, never going above about 320 parts per million. But over the past 100 years, it's increased from about 280 parts per million before the Industrial Revolution to 410 parts per million per today. And this number is changing rapidly. When I first started giving this talk, excuse me, a couple of years ago, it was considered a big milestone that we had hit 400 parts per million. But now, two years later, we're at 410. And the Earth has not seen this level of carbon dioxide for at least hundreds of thousands of years and well before the advent of modern so human civilization, which was really only about 10,000 years ago. So this rise in concentration of CO2 and greenhouse gases in our atmosphere is not surprisingly causing the planet to warm. And it should be noted that warming is really the expected result. It would be unexpected 
if the planet didn't warm. So the planet today is about one degree Celsius warmer than it was 100 years ago, and this trend is increasing. This image is of, of a NASA graph that is updated yearly on their website, and this appeared, it appeared in this form on the cover of the New York Times last week. And as you can see, the five warmest years on record have been the, the last five years. Now, please note that over the past decades, some years have been hotter and some years have been cooler. In 2008, for example, one could have said, as some people did, that the warming had stopped and global warming had plateaued, but this did not turn out to be the case. So this graphic is from the U.S. Global Change Research Program, and it describes observed changes that are now occurring in the United States. And you can see that the effects of the changing climate are not uniform across the country, or certainly not across the world. Different regions are experiencing different impacts. So in the west and in the north, heat waves have become more frequent and intense. Wildfires are increasing in frequency and intensity as the west, as 2018 showed uh, so tragically and drought is affecting southwestern regions. Conversely, in the northeast, rain is falling increasingly in heavy downpours, and this, along with rising sea level, has increased flooding events. The northeast is also experiencing hurricanes of increased intensity, though not necessarily uh, increased frequency. All right, so what do these ch changes mean for the health of kids? So over the past 100 years, we have made tremendous gains in the health and safety of children. Children today are much safer from infectious diseases and from dangers such as motor vehicle accidents. They have safer and more nutritious food, cleaner air, and we have made tremendous strides in protecting the health of mothers and newborn infants, including those being born prematurely. So climate change is throwing a wrench into, some, into these critical gains. It's amplifying existing risks, and it threatens to reverse some of the gains that have been made over the past century. The child health effects of climate change are being felt in our offices today, and they are expected to become more apparent as the planet continues to warm. So changes in the climate are affecting the geographic range and the seasonal timing of some infectious diseases. Warming temperatures, as well as increasing concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, are affecting the growth and the allergenicity of some plants. Rising temperatures and hotter summers are putting more children at risk of heat illness. And worsening extreme weather events are harming children directly through injury or even death and, and have lifelong indirect effects on children through separation from or loss of their caregivers devastation of their communities and significant mental health effects. So I'm now going to speak about a few of these uh, health impacts in my limited time using patients that I've uh, cared for in my own practice. So I'll start with he was a 15-year-old football player in my practice. August 2nd was his first day of football practice and his coach scheduled two practices for this first day. Generally not a good idea. During second practice, he developed pain in his calves. He was treated with massage and he went back to play, but the pain spread to his back and he collapsed. He was admitted to the hospital where he was found to have severe heat illness with muscle breakdown and kidney injury. We treated him with IV fluids for three days and he recovered completely. And interestingly, three of his teammates were treated for heat exhaustion in the ER on the same day that he was admitted. So the United States is experiencing overall warming as well as more extreme heat events. And please note that this increase is not uniform. Some parts of the country, particularly the north, northern regions, and Alaska, have seen temperatures increase the most, while there are some pockets which have experienced little change or even slight cooling. But increasing heat, not surprisingly, puts more people at risk of heat illness. Now, some groups are at particularly high risk of heat illness. The elderly are at the highest risk. Outdoor workers are exposed to some of the most extreme environmental conditions, including extreme heat. And student athletes, particularly football players, are considered a high-risk group. Football players actually have 11 times higher risk of heat illness than all other sports combined in one study. And that's because they begin training in August, the hottest month of the year, and they also have heavier gear, they have higher BMIs, uh, and other factors. 
Numerous studies have shown that infants less than one year are at particularly high risk of heat-related mortality. And this is thought to be related to a higher sweating threshold, the lower blood volume, and of course their inability to express their needs. This graph here uh, depicts heat illness emergency room and urgent care visits in Virginia last summer between May and June 9th, May 1st and June 19th. And you can see a dramatic increase in heat-related visits on June 18th and 19th when an extreme heat event brought temperatures nine degrees above the historical maximum. So in Virginia, as in other regions, extreme heat puts people at increased risk of emergency room visits and urgent care visits for heat. And you can see that heat illness uh, increases gradually with rising temperature, but then increases pretty dramatically when the temperature goes above 95 degrees. And between May and September of last year, uh, 2,723 Virginians went to the emergency room visit or urgent care for heat illness. Now in Richmond, Virginia, there are now about five more days above 95 degrees than occurred in the 1970s. So this means five more days when Virginians are at increased risk of developing heat illness. I'm now going to switch to another topic, and this is allergic rhinitis. This is a patient, a picture of my adorable patient, a two-year-old I saw last spring. She was being treated with an oral antihistamine, but she continued to have these uh, significant allergic shiners, so her mom brought her in. She responded to a nasal steroid. And for many physicians, it's clear that allergies have worsened. And a survey of uh, three medical societies, including, including the American Academy of Allergy and Immunology, American Thoracic Society, Two-thirds of surveyed physicians indicated that climate change was causing their patients to have more allergy symptoms and visits. I'm going to bring us back for a moment to our middle school bio. And as you may remember, carbon dioxide is like a plant food. It's taken up by plants through photosynthesis. And higher CO2 can increase the growth of plants. Now, this can be a good thing um, when we're talking about wheat, particularly in northern regions but it's not as good when we're talking about plants that cause allergies. And it, this plants exposed to higher CO2 also can devote more energy to reproduction through higher uh, production of pollen. It causes numerous other changes in plants, which I find very fascinating, but I don't have time to talk about today. So research done back in the 1990s found that ragweed grown experimentally at higher CO2 concentration produced more pollen. This graph depicts results from three different studies which show the percent rise in ragweed pollen production on the x-axis for plants grown at different CO2 concentrations on the y-axis. Grass pollen has also been shown to increase in response to elevated carbon dioxide. This slide is from a study evaluating Timothy grass, a major cause of summer allergies. And the study found that grass is grown at 800 parts per million CO2 produce three times more pollen than plants grown at 400 parts per million CO2. A recent study evaluated oak trees grown in different CO2 environments. The image on the top is, uh, is of an outdoor carbon enrichment facility, is what these are called uh, when plants are grown in, uh, in, uh, in a particular CO2 environment. And these, plant, these oak trees were grown at 400, 560, and 720 parts per million CO2. Remember, we're at 400 right now, or 410. And the trees that were grown at 720 parts per million produced 1,299% more pollen than the trees grown at 400. So this experimental research is playing out in physicians' offices. Allergy Partners Richmond has been monitoring pollen counts on their roof since the 1980s. Actually, the same woman has been measuring it uh, every day since that time. And although this data has not yet been published, and they have found that their peak tree pollen count has increased over 50%. Allergy Partners Richmond is now working uh, with the Science Museum of Virginia evaluating this, this uh, decades-old data. Now, I've been talking about uh, CO2 effects on plant allergies, but rising temperatures also affect the timing of the allergy season, and there's a lot of research in this field as well. As spring arrives earlier, the pollen season starts earlier, and as the first frost, the winter comes later, the season also lasts longer. Allergy Partners Richmond has found that the peak tree pollen count is arriving about a week earlier now than it did in the 1980s. And again, this is unpublished data. 
So the last patient I'm going to discuss is an 18-month-old who came to me in June with a rash similar to this one. He had just returned from Maine where he'd been on vacation with his family. He had erythema migrans due to Lyme disease. So for pediatricians, infectious diseases and climate are inextricably linked. It's built into our practice every day. We all know that a fever in February has a completely different differential diagnosis than a fever in August because different pathogens have different climate conditions in which they thrive and transmit disease. So it's really no surprise that a change in climate is bringing a new dimension to infectious diseases. The relationship between climate variables and infectious disease can be quite complex, and that's because the changes in climate, which you see on the upper left, temperature, humidity, wind, and dust, each can independently affect the changes in the circle. They can independently affect the host, the pathogen, and the infectious disease transmission cycle. And so there's also a lot of other moving parts in terms of how people react uh, to changing climate. For example, do we go outside more or less? How are we living? Are, uh, how are we using land? Are we living in dense urban environments? So there's a lot of moving parts, moving in different directions and, being inf and having different influences. So take, for example, Lyme disease. Changes in temperature and humidity separately affect the life cycle and the range of the Borrelia bacteria, the Ixodes scapularis tick, the white-footed mouse, the white-tailed deer, and of people. But we, there are some uh, studies have shown some uh, findings, some conclusions that have shown some trends that are occurring today, and further research is needed uh, so we have better understanding of what to expect in the future. So the number of tick-borne infections in the United States is increasing dramatically, and this is true not only for humans but for dogs and for wildlife. As I've indicated, the reasons for this are complex and include changes in land use and wild animal populations. However, warming and shorter winters are allowing more days for tick to be active, ticks to be active and successful at reproducing, particularly in northern latitudes, which were previously too cold to support tick populations. And so this has contributed to increased tick population density and, and infections, particularly in Canada and New England. So New England and Canada have experienced tremendous increases in their tick-borne infections, and these are expected to continue, uh, the research has shown in Canada particularly, as these regions continue to warm. So my patient would have been very unlikely to contract Lyme disease in Maine in 2001. But we should note that ticks also don't like it extremely hot or dry. So as Lyme disease spreads northward, it could potentially retract in the south as it gets too hot. This hasn't occurred uh, yet, as Lyme has also expanded southward. And this is thought to be related to increased deer populations and more trees in regions that had previously been cleared for farming 100 years ago. So another very interesting climate-sensitive uh, and pediatric infection is hand, foot, and mouth disease. But like other enteroviruses, Coxsackie virus in infections increase in warm weather. Last year, a meta-analysis was done, including 72 studies evaluating the relationship between hand, foot, and mouth and weather variables. And they found a positive statistically significant relationship between hand, foot, and mouth disease cases and temperature in 61 out of 67 studies and humidity in 41 out of 54 studies. There was an average 6.3% increase in hand, foot, and mouth per one degree uh, temperature, Celsius temperature rise, and an average 3.5% increase in hand, foot, and mouth cases per 1% rise in humidity. So to summarize my presentation so far, I hope that you'll understand that climate change is happening, that we're causing it, and it's bad for our health. But I want to now discuss how it is also solvable, and that as pediatricians, we can be a vital part of the solution to help ensure a healthy planet for healthy kids. So physicians across the country and the world are increasingly becoming engaged in efforts to protect our climate, to protect the health and welfare of our patients and our communities. In 2017, our country's leading medical organizations came together to form the Medical Society Consortium on Climate and Health. The American Academy of Pediatrics was a founding member of this group, 
and they now represent over half of doctors in the United States through their medical societies. And joining the Medical Society Course Consortium uh, through their website is free and is a great way to learn about how the medical community is responding to climate change health impacts. Now, the U.S. health sector is also a part of the problem. We use a lot of energy and we produce a lot of waste. We're responsible for about 10% of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. That means that we can be an important part of the solution by reducing our own impact on the climate system. And this uh, site, this is a the Climate Action Playbook for Hospitals is produced by a wonderful organization which is a leader in healthcare sustainability, healthcare without harm. So health systems across the country are taking this seriously and are transitioning to clean energy sources to power their facilities. Such as at Aurora Health System in Illinois, they are the 10th largest hospital group in the United States and they've committed to using 100% renewable energy sources by 2030. Rochester Regional Health in New York has committed to 100% carbon-free energy by 2025. And I love this quote by their president and CEO, it's the right thing to do, not only for our community, but for all communities. Kaiser Permanente has pledged to be completely carbon neutral by 2020. Now, health system transportation is another large source of our pollution. Dignity Health in California is the fifth largest hospital system in the, in the nation, and they're transitioning to zero carbon transportation with an emphasis on active transportation, which is walking and biking. Now, Seattle Children's Hospital has been a leader in sustainable transportation. Over 10 years, they cut their drive-alone commutes in half. And how'd they do this? By charging their employees to drive and park and paying them to bike. They also have a free bike repair shop in the hospital. Now, hospitals also produce a lot of waste. We produce about 30 pounds of waste per patient per day. And there are many opportunities to reduce this waste. Health Partners in Minnesota in 2016, they diverted 166 tons of food waste to composting. They recycled 1,500 tons of materials and diverted 793,000 pounds of waste from the operating room, which saved their health system almost a million dollars. Now, pediatricians, we're very used to caring for our patients one-on-one -on -one in our offices. This is our comfort zone. But sometimes we need to step out of our comfort zone, as you may notice, I'm very out of my comfort zone uh, in this photograph, to care for uh, every child through advocacy. We can support policies that promote clean energy on the national and the state level. We can educate elected officials on the risks that climate change poses to our patients, to children, and we can promote efforts to protect families and our communities from the anticipated effects of climate change. So here in Virginia, clinicians have come together at the state level to advocate for climate solutions through this new group, Virginia Clinicians for Climate Action. I'm very proud to be chair and co-founder of this organization. And you can join for free on our website and learn all about the many things that are going on uh, in the state of Virginia. There is great work being done at Carillion. And if you're interested in learning more about what's happening there uh, at Carillion, I'd recommend you contact Sarah Wolford. We are now um, doing some planning for a, a health, climate and health conference at Carillion in the fall uh, in collaboration with some of the amazing researchers uh, at Virginia Tech. So in summary, climate change is happening. We're causing it. It's bad for health, and it's solvable. So as pediatricians, we can help ensure a healthy planet for healthy kids. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, Dr. Adut, for a great presentation. You've given us lots to think about. I also want to thank you for pointing out some of the work that Carillion is working towards, Sarah Wolford's work in decreasing the waste at Roanoke Memorial and trying to push that out to our other centers. Also, our New River Valley um, Hospital has incorporated uh, solar panels to increase renewable energy savings at that hospital as well. So you're correct in that everybody has a, has a part in this and we can all participate. One of the questions I had about uh, the infectious concerns is that there's been recent uh, studies that show that as the Arctic ice melts that we will be seeing some 
older organisms um, being released in the thaw, so older bacteria and viruses with different genomes. How, what other infectious etiologies do you think might be affected by climate change? Sure. So there's numerous organisms which thrive in warmer weather. Um, for example, uh, bacteria that can, can contaminate our food supply. Um, and there's a concern that we'll have to work harder to protect the food supply uh, from contamination uh, by bacteria um, and will be con increasingly reliant on refrigeration. Also, um, heavy downpours um, and extreme precipitation events can overwhelm uh, our septic systems and can have uh, these events often precede outbreaks of gastrointestinal disease as our water, uh, water sanitation systems get overwhelmed and can, uh, can lead to GI outbreaks. So those are some other infections. An interesting one for Virginia uh, is Vibrio. And Vibrio is, uh, Vibrio is, as I talked about some of the complexities in infectious diseases, Vibrio is a bit more simple in that Vibrio, when there's warmer water, there's more Vibrio. It's, so it's fairly direct. And particularly because of our thriving oyster industry, there's a big, there's a concern that the warming seawater uh, presents a greater threat uh, for, for Vibrio contamination uh, of oysters. So those are some other infectious diseases that uh, are, are being monitored carefully. Well, thank you for that, and we really appreciate your time today. We look forward to having you visit us here at Carilion Children's in the fall, um, and we look forward to further collaborations with you about this important topic. Absolutely. Well, thank you for the opportunity. It's been a pleasure to speak to you all out there today. Absolutely. And real fast, um, I know Dr. Dunsmore has to step out, but I will um, go ahead and unmute our phones really quickly. I know we have about 20, 22 people on, uh, so I want to make sure we, we give them an opportunity to, um, to ask any questions or make any comments. So uh, I'm going to unmute the phones here now. You'll hear two voices come on over the phone system, um, but uh, if you do not want to ask a question or make a comment, just please put your phone on mute now. The conference sorry, is now in talk mode. Available. Okay, so the conference lines are open. So if you, if anyone has a question for Dr. Adut, now is the uh, time you can go ahead and ask. Okay, I'm gonna put the Jeopardy theme song back on. Okay, so I don't hear anyone asking any questions or making any comments, and I don't see any coming through. Um, I know that was a lot of information packed into 30 minutes. So like Dr. Dunsmore said, um, Dr. Adut is coming here uh, in the fall and we'll be doing a, a Grand Rounds presentation then uh, that we will also be webcasting out. So we will uh, have more of a long format uh, to, to see her material and to ask any questions. So once again, thank you uh, for joining us and uh, we appreciate your time this afternoon. Um, for everyone listening live or uh, through this as a recording, uh, you can uh, claim your .5 hours of Category 1 AMA PRA credit. Um, for the live participants, go to your calendar appointment uh, that has the survey link for CME there, and you can fill that out for your, uh, if, you're, if you're listening to this live. If you're watching this on YouTube as a recording, you want to go to the notes button, uh, kind of the show me more button under the video, and then you'll see the same link to the survey there. Uh, if you ever need to see how much CME credit you have through Carillion, you can go to CarillionClinic.org slash CME and, and click on the CME Tracker system. Everything gets updated into that system, and it's about two weeks um, out from uh, our event. So give it a little bit of time. If you don't see today's session in there, uh, it should show up in about two weeks. Um, again, if you have anyone who you think should join our uh, professional network, we have about 1,000 clinicians on our list so far from around our region. Uh, you can always email us at outreach at CorellianClinic.org, um, and uh, we will happily add them for free to our network. Um, so if we don't have any other questions or comments on the line, we will go ahead and wrap up. So one last time, any questions or comments for today's speaker? Once, going twice. Okay, we are out of time then. So thank you very much, Dr. Adu. We appreciate uh, your, your time this afternoon, and uh, we look forward to uh, hearing more from you in the fall. Yes, I look forward to coming down. 
All right. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. All right, we will go ahead and uh, disconnect the phone lines now for everyone. Uh, please remember to fill out your CME report uh, and uh, join us again next month. Thank you. <laughs>